I'm Nate Eaton, and joining me from his office in Michigan is John DeMay, who uh, I, I saw John's story on a national news program a couple of months ago and and felt the need to reach out to him because of what he and his family have been through over the past, well, since really March of 2022, right, John? That's when your, your son uh, took his life. It, it's an important issue that affects so many teenagers and so many people. So, John, could you take us back? to the spring of 2022 and, and talk about what happened with your son, Jordan. Yeah. Uh, appreciate you having me. Um, you know, we're just trying to get uh, the word out and, and uh, make some folks aware of what's happening. And it's a pretty serious issue, but um, in March of uh, late March 25th of 2022, um, uh, my son took his own life in his, in his room in our home um, after he was extorted online um, by what we now know after the, uh, a lengthy investigation are uh, multiple um, Nigerians uh, from Nigeria who perpetrated this um, uh, crime on my son. It basically started off with a single message early on in the evening of the night before around 10 PM, he received the, the first message and all it said was hello. Um, he started interacting with this young lady um, the conversation it progressed over uh, a couple hours, and shortly after midnight, um, she convinced my son to take a uh, explicit picture of himself and send it to her, which she did. Um, and when he did that, um, then the light switch flipped, and the script flipped, and he was immediately uh, extorted for money. So this is all happening over the, a series of a few hours, as as you guys are probably sleeping in your room, and he's in his room. Yep, correct. Um, so the last time I saw him, we were we were preparing uh, to go on vacation the next morning, Friday morning, uh, for a Florida trip for a couple weeks. Um, and we we do this every year. And Jordan loves the beach, and this was a you know it's always something that we always look forward to. So he was excited to go. His bags were packed. Um, he was shopping uh, the night before, getting suntan lotion and things for the trip uh, for the next morning. And um, you know this this thing happened and. Uh, unfortunately, that trip got canceled. He thinks he's talking with a girl. Once he sends the photo, he realizes it's a scammer. Did what? What were their tactics like as far as trying to get this money out of him? Were they pretty demanding? Extremely, yeah. They they're very good, and and it was um, what we're learning to be um, a conspiracy. There was multiple players involved. Um, so one person's kind of the face person that's communicating. There's other people in the background that are doing research on their friends and family, going through their social media, trying to um, find information on them. Um, they they are making him feel like they're going to be sending these pictures to everybody, his friends, his, his friends, mothers, um, family, everybody. And the pressure was on. It was very fast. Um, they never let him uh, up for air. And they wanted money. And he said, how much they wanted uh, like a thousand dollars and he couldn't pay that. So they negotiated. Um, he ended up paying them like three hundred dollars. Um, I believe he paid them multiple times, smaller amounts. They were making him prove that he was making the payments to them, showing them screenshots and, and such. Um, and they just kept on him, wanting more and more and more. Um, and then eventually they just wore him down, you know, the middle of the night. He's by himself. He's freaking out. <clears throat> no one, to, no one to go to. Everybody's sleeping. And he, he felt like his whole world was caving in and he had no choice. Um, and Jordan told him, he said, um, I'm going to kill my, I'm going to kill myself because of you. And, and the extortionist said, good, you better do it or I'm going to make you do it. And wow. It. And, and, you know, I, the, looking at your son, the, the photos the, he, he, he was on the football team, handsome young man. Uh, I'm sure it had a very active social life, not to stigmatize anybody. It's not like he was, you know, a loner. It doesn't seem like that, at least. Um, I mean, this kid kind of had everything going for him. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about that. And, and honestly, that's why Jordan was such a perfect victim. And that's why so many other kids are, are perfect victims, because in that moment, in my son's moment uh, in time, his life as he knew it may have been over. You know, that's what he's thinking. My life is over. I'm never going to recover from this. And it may have been in that moment, but honestly, we all know as adults and having the life experience and a little bit more development, we know that, hey, the next the next day is going to be tough. The next week's going to be tough. It's going to be embarrassing, but we're all going to move on. 
he would have been going to college. He would have gotten married, had kids, had a home, all the things that we we typically do. And all that stuff would just be that this that one incident would have come kind of um, fallen in the background and and maybe even been a giggle moment at some point in his life. Um, but unfortunately, they just don't have the capacity at that time to do it. And and uh, that that's why it's such a um, interesting crime. And it's such a, a lucrative way for criminals to make money because it's a sensitive issue. It's private. So a lot of these people, even after we've come out with this internationally, parents and, and people have contacted me from all over the world um, sharing their stories. Some of them have gone to the police. Others have not and just wanted to kind of get it off their chest that this happened. And um, I've been worried about it for a long time. And it just there's the embarrassment factor and they didn't want to say anything. So the the fact that this crime is kept under the covers because of the sensitivity and the fact that they're targeting kids that have uh, what appears to be, you know, everything going for them. They're the athletes. They're the top of the class. They're popular. They have lots of friends on their social media. They're active. So they they hone in on that and drill through it until they break them down. So one of the quotes you said, which I remember, is someone came into his bedroom at three in the morning and murdered him through Instagram when we were all sleeping and we had zero chance to stop it. Uh, when did you realize that the reason for your son's death was because of this? I mean, how did you put all the pieces together? We found out, um, about the second day that, that, um, that this was going on, the extortionist had, uh, sent his picture to his girlfriend. And when she discovered that photo, um, she called us and let us know. We, and then we got the photo and then we realized something else was going on. We didn't know what, but it was something because those first day, day and a half, two days <clears throat> were obviously shocking. And, and we were just banging our head against the wall trying to figure out what, what in God's creation could have happened um, because it was just out of nowhere. Um, so when we saw that picture, um, I think for me, it clicked and it's like, all right, there's something here and something going on. And it was a day or two after that, um, that law enforcement took the picture, contacted um, the FBI. They kind of worked together, um, ended up getting the transcript of the Instagram um, feed, which had already been deleted before Jordan died. He deleted everything. He deleted the, the messages. Everything was gone. So at face value, when you look at a phone or you look at someone's social media account afterwards, it didn't look like anything out of the ordinary. Fortunately, um, everything on the internet's on the internet forever. And so was this, and we ended up getting a hold of the transcript and, and everything was there plain as day. Uh, that's what started the investigation. So when you realized this as, a, as his dad, I, I'm sh what, what emotions were you feeling? I'm sure it was infuriating anger, kind of a, a mix of everything. Yeah, you know, it's the grief process is interesting. And and I always say the human body is a pretty amazing um, specimen because there's there's so many things that happen. And um, I have friends that have lost children from different things over the years. And you always you always see them and you're like, how do these people function and how do you get through this? And I never could understand that. But I guess now that I'm here, <clears throat> uh, we just we just do and we find purpose and uh, and we have to move forward. I have other children. I have, I have a spouse. I have family. And so we have to keep going, but it, it was at that time, you know, there's everything right there. There's shock, there's uh, frustration, there's anger, um, there's sadness. Um, so in the beginning, it, it, it was just a lot of everything and every minute it changed. It wasn't even like how I felt that day. It was like every minute it would fluctuate. Um, and some of that's more off over time, but you know, now, now it switches back and forth, maybe not on a minute basis, but on a daily basis, I, I feel differently. So of course there's anger there. Um, there's, there's extreme anger there and there isn't, there probably isn't, um, a punishment in the world. That's gonna, that's gonna make me feel better for these clowns. Um, but we have to move forward and hopefully the justice system will, will serve us and we will get some sort of vindication. So the, the clowns you reference, it's it's one of the things that's unique is that so often when these scammers are overseas, they're never found. You can't track them down. But in this case, they the FBI did, right? Tell, tell me how they were able to find not only uh, the one person, but it's three, right? Three Nigerian men who were arrested? 
Uh, there's actually six total. Six, um, okay. Yeah, and and they're all they're all lodged in Nigerian jails uh, currently, three of which are are being extradited into the United States at some point. Um, that's a lengthy process, um, and it's just not something that's done overnight. So that we're still waiting uh, on that piece. So there are there are six total, but three will be coming back here hopefully. Any idea how they were able to to find them and and how many other victims they preyed upon? Um, I, I really don't know the exact details of how they did it. Um, you know, the, the, uh, FBI and the, and the partnering agencies are very limited with the information on, on logistically and how they do things for all the reasons you can imagine. Um, but as any, as you can imagine, it probably starts with IP addresses and working their way back and, and, and unpeeling that onion. Um, and once you start finding where you need to go, then all those IP addresses start to veer off into different directions and other victims are discovered. And I believe the indictment um, that's public, you can read it. Um, there was over a hundred other victims that were associated with these, with these, with this particular group. Um, not necessarily deaths involved, but, but money uh, and other, and other parts and at, at different levels, but over a hundred. Wow. I know that there's going to be some people watching saying, well, this, this doesn't happen here. This doesn't happen in our neighborhood or, you know, with, with our teenagers uh, in Eastern Idaho, if you're watching, I've seen the police reports that come in every day and it, it has happened. Fortunately, not any suicides that we know of, but people being victims of sextortion where they send these photos. So uh, what do people need to know, John, what do parents need to know and teenagers who might be watching this? Yeah, so it, that's a really good part, and also what law enforcement needs to know. So, I would say what what the parents need to know is it is happening. It's happening everywhere. I live in a very small community where twenty twenty five thousand people here. Um, I've lived here the majority of my life. I've never locked my door, not in my house, not in my car. I don't take things out of my car. There's my wallets in my car half the time. We do we do not have to worry about any of that stuff here. Uh, we are a very quiet um, um, small town on the South Shore of Lake Superior. It's beautiful here, but um, I would say the same thing before this happened to me. It, it, this will never happen to me and it'll never happen. The, the problem is, is, is the internet and social media has created uh, a, a space where all this can happen and it is happening and it's happening a lot and it's happening anywhere. So if your children have access to internet, they are potential victim and it's likely that they're going to be victimized. Not Maybe not to the extent that we were, uh, but young ladies are being victimized on all sorts of different levels, um, body shaming, bullying, all the way down to this, these basic things that are happening, um, building this this false sense of reality for young people, sending them off for ye of years of of misinformation uh, from social media and how how life really actually is. Right. So there's all these levels of victimization and it's all coming from from the Internet and social media uh, specifically. So if your kids have access to that stuff you need to monitor it. You need to monitor it. You need to uh, keep the, keep the devices out of their bedrooms. Um, the, the one thing that we've, we've kind of learned over this is that in the extreme circumstances like ours and many other families, <clears throat> the, the kids being exclusive with their phones in private is a major issue. So if you're letting your kids in their bedrooms privately with their uh, internet connection, that's a really, really bad thing. Um, it's a very bad thing. Don't let them in the basements. They they need to be upfront with that. Um, there's apps that you can monitor texting and and their their app usage and all those things. Those are those are some things that you should be looking at doing. Limiting their their phone usage, um, shut, shutting things down, shut the internet down off their phone. There's there's phone settings. Verizon has settings. Other carriers have settings. Let's let's uh, do a little bit better job as parents keeping our kids off the internet. Now my son was was a few you know a few weeks away from being 18. So at this point right. we were you know, his, his wings were flying, he was ready to fly the coop, you know? So again, our situation is, is very, very unique, but there's, there's families out there with 12 and 14 year olds that are going through this too, because uh, frankly, the parents just aren't, aren't paying attention to what they're doing. Their kids are doing on their phones and they're just not paying attention to what's happening. So they don't mind them being exclusive in their rooms. They don't think about that stuff. So parents need to really step up and pay attention to what's happening with their kids' internet use. Um, yeah. For the kids, you know, for the young people, uh, and it's happening to adults too. This isn't just happening to teenagers, young people. This is happening to grown adults as well. Um, biggest thing is, is if you find yourself in this situation, shut your computer off. Don't delete anything. Call the FBI, call the local police department, call a family, call friends, somebody, 
but it ultimately has to go to law enforcement. They need to track it. There's there's places that law enforcement can um, can enter data, and and you can as a parent too, or as a victim, you can file a report with exploited missing children as well. And they want to know that information because they build a database of this. Um, so it can help in future cases like ours when it, when it does become very serious, um, we that can help link back to some places. So law enforcement um, can help out uh, a little bit more in that sense as well. Yeah, but uh, like you said, you're if you're in that moment in the middle of the night in your bedroom and you're suddenly getting blackmailed, uh, I, I guess if you can just shut it down, take a step back. Yes. You've like, you, but it feels like the whole world is, is caving in on you. And you mentioned uh, in one of your other interviews that you had been monitoring, monitoring Jordan's social media, but he was almost 18. He was almost an adult. So at that point he's, you know, kind of on his own. And the reports we see happened at the local university, you know, yeah. so these yep. people are adults. Yep. Yeah, there's no doubt. And, and like I said, Jordan was six weeks away from his 18th birthday and six weeks away from graduating high school. So um, he was on his way. But I can tell you personally from the families that I know personally that have come to me after we went public with this, um, dozens and dozens and dozens of families just locally here that I know that I had no idea that this happened to. Hey, this happened to my son. He was at, he was he first year at college, you know, second year at college, senior in high school. Um, so it's happening a lot, but yeah, definitely. I think the, the, the teaching moment is just to shut the, shut the computer, walk away, take a breath. It's going to be fine. You just have to tell yourself that it's going to be fine. And then just go talk to somebody, talk to a friend, talk to your parents, a coach, anybody, just say something to somebody and get some advice on what you think you should do. Um, because you're going to have to work through some of those emotions, but more, more importantly, you have to, to let law enforcement know. Um, and then once you close the computer, really the, the extortion stops, they go away to the next person. So even if you sent them some money, you know, I guess you're out some money, which, um, isn't the worst thing in the world, but it stops after that. So, right. So why have you decided to, to, to be public about this, John? I mean, has this kind of turned into a, a mission for you to, you know, make sure your son's death wasn't, wasn't in vain? Yeah, I think it's a lot of parts and, and Jordan's mother and I have, have been um, very upfront with this. And I think because we're such a small community, um, you know, I, I've been a business owner here and, and Jordan is very popular. So we know a lot of folks here and it was just so shocking. Our community was devastated by this and, and they still are. So I think we felt in the beginning that, hey, we need to let everybody know in the community that this is happening. This is what happened, you know, let the kids know that most popular kid in school didn't just didn't just take his life because he thought his life was horrible. I mean, there was there was a lot of meat behind this and and we wanted to make awareness, obviously, because this is such a crazy thing that's that has just happened to us. And we had no idea how much it's happening to other people. So we thought, well, maybe we should just let people know so they don't become victims, whether they take their own life or hurt themselves or have mental health issues for the rest of their life over this or lose a bunch of money or lose their family farm or whatever it is. We just really need to get up front with this and, and be open about it. And, and for us, we had to do the same thing. We had to step back and say, this is kind of embarrassing, but this is for the greater good. And, and I think, you know, now that we are here and we've been international with this message, the outpour and, and the support has just been overwhelming. Uh, so we know we're, we're on the right track by doing this. So. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I applaud you speaking out. The more that you can tell people, the, the better you can raise awareness, even though it might be a little embarrassing or uncomfortable to talk about. Uh, would you mind sharing, talking about your son, telling me a few things about Jordan? Yeah. Um, you know, Jordan was, uh, Jordan was an amazing young man. He, uh, he was a very good athlete uh, early on. Um, he, he got into basketball and baseball early five, six years old, um, played baseball for a lot of years, got into basketball early, played for, for all the way up until his senior year, um, got into junior high, got into football, really loved football, um, had a couple pretty serious injuries. He had an ACL injury that took him out for an entire season. Um, and uh, we we spent a lot of time rehabbing him, getting him back on. But he was just such a great kid. He, he, he was always happy. And, you know, he just his smile lit up a room and and he he affected he, he affected so many people in a positive way that unfortunately as a parent I didn't I didn't know a lot of this until afterwards when you know people shared things at his service and and, and shared stories um, about him to us and and folks that I would never even imagine that he would even be friends with um, were impacted by him so he was such a larger than life person everything was big he just 
um, you know, you love the outdoors and, you know, you, you like to fish with us and we were hunting and fishing and, and boating and all the fun stuff that we do here in the upper peninsula. And, um, yeah, he was, he was just a super awesome kid. And, and it's, it's a super tragedy that, that we're even discussing this and, and it's my mission at this point to make sure that his legacy moves on and, and carries and saves hopefully thousands of lives. Well, yeah, like I said, thank you for talking about it. I'll be fascinated to see what happens in the court process with these, the suspects and, um, I get any idea. Could they be charged with murder or manslaughter? Anything in connection to your yeah, son's death? There, there are. Yeah. There's uh there's, I believe one of them, the, there's indictments online. Um, you can read, read them online, okay. uh, but they are charged with um, something similar to uh, it's, it's computer uh, computer crime causing death or something along those lines. I think it's a 25 or 30 year felony. Uh, so there's some pretty serious charges um, that are, that they're being held on. Yeah. Which is why they're being extradited. I mean, they don't they don't extradite people for jaywalking uh, and right. money crimes and those sorts of things unless they're really really big. But this one, because it involved death, is is pretty much the only reason that that we have this case. And you could stick a thousand kids in a gym right now in a high school gym, and twenty five percent of them are sending pictures back and forth to one another uh, because that's how they communicate on, on these apps. Um, that, that you know they're not this generation is not social like our generations were. So that's, that's just the new way of communication and um, they're, they're being victimized by it too. So uh, yeah. it's hard to, it's hard to reach that group. Um, but but the, and the scammers know it, the scammers know yeah. that's how they communicate. And so that's where they're going to go. Right. Yeah. Uh, exactly. John, is there anything that you want to add? Anything we didn't touch on? No, I don't think so. I mean, we could talk all day about things and, you know, I just, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to get out to your, to your group of um, viewers and I just hope uh, we can continue the message and have it, have a quick chat with your son or daughter because it's happening to girls too. There, there's plenty of, of ladies that have died from this as well. And, and families that we've met along the way um, with very similar stories. So talk to your kids just to say, Hey, this is happening. And, and I think uh, the big message that I, I would want to say as a parent, maybe I didn't do enough of, we spend a lot of time as parents saying, no, 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 don't do this. Don't do that. Um, we need to spend a little bit extra time and I'm working with, with my situation and my, my personal family and my two young girls that I have <clears throat> saying that, okay, I don't want you to do this, but if you do, this is what needs to happen. So we need to learn how to, to, to take it to the next level and say, but if you do, this is, this is how we handle this um, and prepare them because they need to take that step back. They need to think about that comment in that moment and say, okay, my mom told me not to do this, but I did. And, but if I do, I need to close this computer and walk away and go talk to somebody. And that's what needs to happen. It's such great advice. My oldest is 10 and she's starting to get to the point where she wants to be on the iPad on YouTube and take it into her room and, and, uh, you know, she wants to text, she doesn't have a cell phone, but wants to send messages back and forth to her friends. And it, it's scary. <laughs> it's scary. You hear so many of these things, but you can't just say no, you can't just shut it off and say no way because they're going to yeah. find a way. So I think communication is is the key, as you said. Well, have some ground rules, right? I think we just need to be better. Um, when my son was early, he got a phone relatively early. His mother moved away out of state for a little while. So we got him a phone at 10 or 11 to kind of communicate. Uh, but when we did that, I made him sign a contract at 11 years old saying, here's the rules. There's no phone after seven. There's this, there's that. And I had a dozen different things. I made him sign it. Yeah. I have it somewhere. I'm looking for it. Um, but that that was just the start of it. I, I had Verizon family settings on there. So he couldn't, there was porn filters on there. There was language filters on there. Um, we had I, uh, iPhone settings on there and we got him an iPhone because the settings, the parental controls were so awesome. Um, and then I actually had a separate Wi-Fi router set up in the house. So, so my wife and I could have our own router. And then we had, we had a router uh, for him. And then I had that on a timer so that the internet would shut off completely for him at, at like seven o'clock at night. So he couldn't even be on the internet. So there's things that we did to, to try to protect ourselves from that. And, you know, as much as, as much a great links as we went through to protect him, here we are in this situation. So I think we just need to do everything we can to, to mitigate that. Yeah. John, thank you so much for chatting with me. Yeah. 